Well, good morning once again. Welcome to Grace. As we continue our journey through the Bible today, I want to begin our lesson where we left off in our previous lesson. And as you recall, we had entered what I call the fourth cornerstone, the final cornerstone or final section of the book of Romans. I've called it the fourth cornerstone because each one of these cornerstones are about a different subject or a different topic as Paul lays it out for us in four parts. Now, as a very quick recap, in the first cornerstone of Romans, uh, chapters 1 through 5, Paul told us about our perfectly righteous or perfectly just standing before God and what that means to us. Um, there we learned that our righteousness before God comes not by way of our promise, comes not by way of our performance, but is a gift decree from God based solely upon our taking him at his word, otherwise called faith in scripture or belief, uh, taking him at his word concerning what Christ accomplished, where God's justice is, uh, for our sins is concerned. When his son died for those sins at Calvary, was buried and rose again from the dead victorious over sin in the grave. God's justice was perfectly and forever satisfied at Calvary for everyone, all the sins of all mankind, uh, according to the Apostle Paul. Christ bore those sins upon himself, suffering the wrath of God that the world deserved. That was the first cornerstone of Romans. Then we came to the second cornerstone of Romans, chapters 6 through 8, the cornerstone called sanctification. Uh, we learned how God could declare believing sinners to be as righteous as God himself, uh, the God-man, and do so legally. God accomplished our being set apart as perfectly holy by way of a special spiritual union uh, that God designed to take place at the point of every person's belief. A union between the believer and the God-man, the God's son. In that union, the believer becomes the automatic recipient of all that belongs to Jesus Christ. And of course, that includes the righteousness that Christ Jesus had always, has always possessed. In the third cornerstone of Romans, chapters 9 through 11, Paul taught us what happened in regard to God's plan and purpose with Israel from a national standpoint and how that plan and purpose has not been discarded. It's simply been placed on hold or postponed for a time um, until God completes his economy, uh, the word translated dispensation in, in scripture, his economy of Gentile grace. Paul called the present economy of, of God the dispensation of the grace of God the economy of the grace of God, which God commissioned Paul to make known to the entire world. Now, as we've discovered, God had every right to destroy the Gentiles or the nations. It's the same word. He had every right to destroy the nations that had rejected him prior to the call of Abram. Remember, Paul said when they knew him, they didn't want to keep him in their thoughts. They discarded God. They became, as, as we would call it today, atheistic in their approach to God. There is no God. And then the offspring of Abraham, the children of Israel, rejected the one who had come as the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. They rejected their Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. So with their rejection of their Messiah, they were no better off than the Gentiles before them. God had every right to destroy Israel from the face of the earth. So he had a right to destroy the entire human creation from the face of the earth. But rather than destroy his human creation, what did he do? He delivered them. As uh, he showered his mercies down upon all mankind, the Bible tells us. <clears throat> so with that short synopsis, we return once again to the entrance of Romans chapter 12, where Paul, in light of the multiple mercies that God has bestowed upon us, is calling upon us. He's calling upon believers today to present our bodies as living sacrifices to God. Let's pull up that passage once again as we begin our study today. And this we might call the final section, the final cornerstone, the presentation cornerstone of Romans. Uh, we might even call it the obligation cornerstone of Romans because we owe it to everyone, according to Paul, to love others. So let's take a look at this final cornerstone as we begin Romans chapter 12 with verses 1 and 2 once again. I beseech you therefore, brethren. Paul is pleading. He's not insisting, not commanding. He's, he's begging in a sense. That's what this word beseech means in the Greek. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, there's our motivation, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
So what Paul is telling us here is since Christ gave his life, sacrificed himself on our behalf, Paul's telling us that the only reasonable, the Greek word from which we get our word logic, so the only logical thing for us to do is to live for him. Given what the Lord has already done for us, the multiple mercies he's shown us, it only makes sense that we give ourselves to serve him. Now, how are we going to do that? Paul's going to take us there. We know what we are to do. <clears throat> Paul is imploring us to yield our bodies, as I said, a living sacrifice. And Paul used that word acceptable, which we've already discovered means well-pleasing. Now, the place of that well-pleasing will be the judgment seat of Christ, where every believer's labor of love will be evaluated. In, in what way will our labor of love be evaluated? We'll be looking at that in today's study. We also know why are we are to yield our bodies a living sacrifice. What a living sacrifice, why? Uh, it's the only reasonable thing to do given the multiple mercies as we've been saying that God has bestowed upon us as we, we've discovered in previous lessons. Those mercies include the gift of his very own son who died the wrath of God, uh, suffering the wrath of God in our stead in order to satisfy the justice of God where our sins are concerned. To not count men's sins against them is an ultimate act of mercy. To elevate us, to give us everything that belongs to Christ and elevate us into the heavenlies with Christ, that's an act of grace. So you can see mercy is not giving men what they deserve. Grace is coming along and giving man way more than he deserves. Uh, having told us what we believers are to be doing and why we are to be doing it, Paul's now ready to take us to the how part of reasonable worship. How are we to yield our bodies a living sacrifice? What does it mean to present our bodies a living sacrifice unto the Lord as our reasonable service or worship unto him? Unto him? Because Paul calls this reasonable service our worship. So if you thought of worship as a coming on Sunday morning for an hour or singing songs or as some folks would say lifting your hands to the air, uh, that's not worship from Paul's perspective. Now that may be a type of worship. We're not not downgrading those things, but the worship that Paul's talking about is the sacrifice of our bodies as living sacrifices on a daily basis. And so keep in mind that God considers what Paul's asking to us to do as being worship, reasonable worship. What would unreasonable worship then be? <laughs> unreasonable worship would include those things that are designed to serve, meaning to worship in this passage, self. Unreasonable worship is putting self on the throne of our lives. Reasonable worship is that worship that takes self completely out of the picture. Now, that's not an easy thing to do. That's not the natural thing for man to do. So is God asking, asking us to, to act in an unnatural way? Yes, he is. He's saying do that which does not come natural to man. Uh, to man, the natural thing is to place ourselves on the throne. Now, I know we've talked about the picture in earlier studies about serving others and that being worship unto God. But think about that. How could worship unto God, vertical, how could that be the same thing as worshiping others, horizontal? Why would God look at worship of others or serving others as being worship unto him? Well, that's the communion picture that we told you about some time ago, but I'll, I'll redo it here for those people who haven't heard it. In Christ's day, Israel was given a picture and that picture contained the broken body first, as you folks know. And what came after the broken body? The blood. That is the typical communion service in churches across the country today. Partaking of the wafer representing Christ's body. And then drinking from the cup or drinking the, the little vial full of whatever it is, uh, which represents his blood. And it had to be in that order. Couldn't be in another order. Why would the cup come uh, the, the, the bread come first and the cup comes second in the communion, typical communion service. Because it had to. For Israel's memorial or Israel's picture of her new covenant, it took the new covenant would take the shedding of Christ's blood. Could not be enacted until the death of the testator. Christ had to die and then shed his blood, which is why in the communion services of the land today, the, the wafer is taken first and then the cup. But now the Apostle Paul comes along and he reverses that order. They say, did he get it wrong? Did Paul get it wrong? No, but he totally reverses the order. 
He said, isn't the cup which we bless our communion with his blood? So now we have a different picture. Isn't the cup which we bless our communion with his blood? The same blood that was shed to initiate the new covenant God promised the house of Israel and the house of Judah is the blood that redeemed us, us Gentiles, as well as Israel. In fact, the blood that redeemed the entire human race. So Paul begins with the cup. And then he goes on to say, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that Christ is the loaf. So Paul began in a reverse order. Isn't the cup which we bless uh, our communion with his blood? Then Paul says, Christ is the loaf. We partake of the loaf. Therefore, we are the loaf. Now, do you see a picture there that Paul's presenting to us? Christ is the loaf. We've partaken of that loaf. Now we are the loaf. Do you see a picture of the body of Christ that Paul's presenting to us? We are the loaf. If you wanted to serve Christ, if you wanted to worship him, sing to him, adore him, tell him how much you love him, when Christ was on the earth, where would you go to do that? If you wanted to serve Christ while he was on the earth, where would you go to do that? You'd find Christ, would you not? You'd want to go find him, Bow down before him, worship him, adore him, sing your songs of praises to him. You'd have to find him to do that. But now if we take a loaf, the picture is complete today, but if we take the wafer called the loaf and we each one break off a piece of that loaf and each one take that loaf, which is, who does the loaf represent? Christ. So picture that loaf as being Christ. Now each of us have a piece of that loaf in our mouths. We're chewing, we swallow, now where is Christ? Do I have to go somewhere to find Christ today if I want to serve him today? You see, the picture's complete today. Where do I go to serve Christ today? Where is he? If you've taken a piece of that loaf, which it represents Christ, and swallowed it, he's in you. But when did he become in you? When you took a piece of the loaf? No, when you accepted Christ and what he did for you at Calvary, where your sins are concerned, at that instant you partook of the loaf and you became a new creation, a new creation in Christ. So we have the fullness of a picture today that in reverse order pictured Israel's new covenant back in Israel's day. It's a totally different picture, folks. So... Yes, we would celebrate today his resurrection from the dead because we are joined to that resurrection body. We are joined to him in such a complete manner that everything that's true of Christ is true of you. The Bible said you died with him. You were crucified with him. You were buried with him. How so? In our identity, not through some ritual or rite performed by a, a religious organization. This is a spiritual union that took place at the moment of your belief. The moment of your belief... Everything true of Christ became true of you because as two became one at the instant of your belief, what belongs to Christ belongs to you. And that includes, as we said, the righteousness that belongs to him. This is how I, I often say or why I often say that God puts Christ's test score for righteousness on our paper, on the paper of everyone who is uh, joined to him. His scorecard is our scorecard now. So... Um, that's the communion picture as Paul presents it in reverse order, which is a completed picture already. A reasonable worship today, from God's perspective, is the sacrifice we offer of ourselves during the course of our earthly lives in service to the body of Christ. And you are, in corporate form, the body of Christ. And individually, you're joined to him as members of the body of Christ. Members in particular, Paul goes on to say, but again, how are we to make that living sacrifice? Uh, Paul begins explaining that in verse 2. Return there with me for just a moment. And be not conformed to this world. That's where Paul takes us right off the bat here. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The first step in reasonable worship unto God, according to the Apostle Paul, is the renewing of our minds. Now that's going to require a little bit of thought. Reasonable worship means nothing apart from renewed, means nothing at all apart from renewed thinking. Without renewed thinking, you can forget reasonable worship because Paul starts out, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Reasonable worship, then, is going to require 
this renewed thinking. In other words here, reasonable worship involves a renovation project when it comes to the thinking part of our being. What do we do when we begin a renovation project? Now think about this for a few moments. Let's say a renovation project for the home. Sometimes we need to move some old things out in order to move some new things in. Is that not right? Get rid of the old, take in the new, and we've renovated. We're not talking about a reorganization project. Now think about this because it's important. A, a reorganization project would be something else altogether. We're not talking, we're talking about a renovation project, not a reorganization project. Reorganization simply means shuffling things around, changing the order of things and shuffling things around, but hanging on to some of those old things. Moving certain things from one place and putting them in another, that's not renovation. That's relocation. And there's a difference in renovation and relocation. Does anyone here have a storage closet in your home? A closet where, you know, that's designated space for just the things you, you're not using anymore, but you don't want to get rid of those things, so you put them in a storage closet. A closet where you, <laughs> you store some things you seldom use, let's say. How about an entire room in your home for storing things you don't want to discard, you want to hang on to? Storage attic, for instance. I'll bet more than a few of us have had, or presently have, a rental storage unit where we actually pay to hang on to some things we don't want to discard. Would that be any of you folks? Sometimes I tell people, I'm stepping on my toes while I'm preaching the message. I'm preaching to myself. I'm preaching to the choir here. The question is why? Why do we do that? What would be your first answer as to why you would store things that you seldom use? I may need those things later on is the most prevalent answer. What if I need that thing that I've got stored in that area? Let me tell you a quick story. I know some of you have heard it, but I'm going to share it with folks who are listening to us on the, uh, on, over the air. Late one afternoon, years ago, when I called home from my mail route, my wife told me that she had held a yard sale that day. Well, that was wonderful. I thought, great, that would be a few extra dollars. She said that she had emptied our storage shed and gotten rid of loads of unnecessary stuff. I said, I hope you didn't sell any of my stuff. I need my stuff. She asked, when was the last time you used something from that shed? Hard as I tried, I couldn't recall. Her reply was, think about a specific something you need that you remember placing in that shed. Now, how am I going to do that? I hadn't opened that shed for probably two or three years. I could remember what I put in there, much less what I might need, and I hadn't needed it in probably three years. The argument was over. You know the most often given answer for hoarding things? Just what I told you. I may need it later. My problem? I couldn't remember what all I had placed in that shed. I hadn't opened that door of the shed, as I told you, for at least two years, much less used anything that I had previously placed in that shed. The storage shed was for the purpose of storing things we didn't use, not for storing things that we used. As a side note here, <laughs> I probably had 30 caulking guns in that storage shed. For what purpose? Well, I may need to use some caulk later on, and I need that gun to to put the caulk in, but try to find a storage, try to find a caulking gun in a storage room that's filled to the door, it's easier to go down and pay a buck and a half and buy a caulking gun than it is to go and find that caulking gun. That's why I had 30 probably in the storage shed. But what's the second most prevalent uh, answer for why we don't get rid of things that we're hanging on to? Those things I'm holding on to are not just stuff. Why, some of those things are memories. Is that not true? What does it take? A week, and then it's no longer a memory. It's become an, starts with the word H. Now it's an heirloom. <laughs> Why, we can't get rid of an heirloom. And who can, who can eliminate an heirloom? You see, our identity is tied to the things that we store in so many cases. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not trying to get anybody to uh, discard any personal possessions, much, much let, uh, less discard an heirloom. But that's not my point here at all. I'm trying to make an illustration, and maybe you'll see it in a minute. The point I'm trying to make through the illustration I've used is that the real reason for holding on to things that we have a difficult time discarding, 
is not really practical. It's emotional. It's emotional. It's our, it's, it's our sentiment. Our, it's a sentimental value we place on things or an emotional tie to those things that we don't want to get rid of. Our memories are stored there. Not that there's anything at all wrong with sentimental values. They don't take me wrong here. Merriam-Webster defines the word sentimental this way, marked or governed by feeling or emotional idealism. Do you see why we hang on to things? It's emotional. It's sentimental. There's a memory there somewhere. It's a mental thing. It's a mind thing that is directly tied to our self-identity, believe it or not. In a very real sense, we might say it's it's a self-identity preservation thing because we all have that. And that's an extremely powerful force when it comes to the flesh, a self-identity preservation thing. We don't eliminate things. We simply reorganize by storing them is what we do. What I want you to do is transfer that thought over to the realm of the spiritual for a moment. What are we to move out in order that we can present ourselves, our bodies, a living sacrifice and service or reasonable worship that's well-pleasing unto the Lord. What does Paul want us to move out? The answer is the most difficult thing for the flesh to let go of. If you've caught the point I was trying to make through that illustration, it's that issue of serving self first and foremost, putting self on the throne of our lives first and foremost. You know what Paul's saying? He's not saying, well, Put yourself first. Make, make that contribution. Put somebody else first today. Make that contribution of yourself today. But before you know it, you're reaching back in the storage shed of your mind, and now you've got yourself first again. You're putting yourself first all over again. So try as, as hard as you might try, self often pops back up. It's going to do that naturally, and we're all going to serve self first after we've tried um, so very desperately to serve others first as we make a contribution. Paul wants a sacrifice, not a contribution. You remember the, the story of the chicken and the, and the pig from last week as they wanted to do something wonderful for their farmer owner. And as you folks will recall, they said, let's make him a meal. And they got together to decide what kind of a meal they'd make. And the chicken said, let's, let's make bacon and eggs for him. <laughs> And the pig said, you're making a contribution. I'd be making a sacrifice. And so Paul's saying, it's not about contributions. This is a renewed thinking, not reorganized thinking. This isn't allowing yourself to become the priority of, of your life every day but on Sunday or every day but on that one day you want to sacrifice a little time and do something, something for someone else. This is a new mindset. This is a renovation of thinking. And Paul's saying, Renovate your thinking. And he's going to give us some more ideas here on how to do that. When it comes to the reasonable worship unto God that Paul's talking about, that Paul's asking of each of us, the reasonable worship that comes by way of offering our bodies a living sacrifice, he isn't talking about a contribution that believers make from time to time, after which we place self back on the throne of our lives. Paul's talking about a living sacrifice as a lifestyle. A living sacrifice that comes by way of that renewed thinking I was talking about that becomes a permanent part of our being. Paul's asking us to eliminate one type of thinking and adopt a brand new type of thinking. Don't store the old type of thinking to reach back and take it out of the storage shed of your mind. Eliminate it. Eliminate it. Paul's asking us to eliminate one type of thinking, thinking and adopt another. Not to store that old type of thinking for those times we want to return to it, uh, but to discard it altogether. What are we to change where our thinking is concerned? Watch Paul explain it to us as we reread verse 2. The key phrase lies in the first seven words. Be not conformed to this world, Paul tells us, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, I know you've heard the expression, we are of necessity in the world, but we're not to be, you finish it, of the world. Sure, you've heard it. We should understand that when Paul tells us to be not, not to be conformed to this world, he isn't talking about becoming a tax resistor. Uh, that's, 
Don't use that verse for that purpose because that's not what he's talking about at all. He's not talking about being disobedient to the laws of the land when those laws of the land do not conflict with the word of God rightly divided. He's not asking us to do that. Adopt what you like about the, the laws of the land and throw away the rest. That's not what Paul's saying here. Paul has something entirely different in mind. Paul's talking about the world system that fallen man has devised in order to make himself happy without God. This is going to require just a bit of thought. That world system, by the way, is uh, a lookout for number one first and foremost system. A serve self first system. John actually defined it for us in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. And by the time 1 John was written, John knew Paul's gospel and he knew Paul's message and he agreed with every bit of it. Listen to John in chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, where he stated, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. In other words, man operating in his fleshly condition is not of the Father, but is of the world. So he defined what being of the world means. Serving the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And he's saying, don't be conformed to this world. You get the picture now, what Paul's asking us to do? Not only is man, in his fallen fleshly condition, a part of the world in which we live, the system operating in this world, the system devised by fleshly man, is a system designed for the express purpose of giving men the means and giving men the permission to feed the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And to keep the pride of life operating to the max, by the way, we might say that fleshly-oriented man has devised a fleshly-oriented system, a system designed to continually feed the flesh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Does this give us a, a, a little bit clearer picture of what Paul's talking about when he says, and be not conformed to this world? It should. Someone has asked about emotions and the part that emotions play when it comes to feeding the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and uh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. We talked about the emotional part of hanging on to things because our identity is tied to those things. Let's talk about those emotions for just a moment. Emotions and thinking are intricately intertwined. Emotions are not a bad thing, by the way. Uh, God designed emotions. We all have them. They're good. And that's as it should be. God depicted himself in Scripture as a God of emotions. Now, as we study the Bible, we see the anger of God. Is anger an emotion? And yet we see the anger of God over and over. Anger is an emotion. We also find that God is a God of laughter in Scripture. He laughed. We see that both in Psalms and in the book of Proverbs. God is a God of compassion, the Bible tells us. Another emotion is seen in the Psalms and in the book of Judges and also in the book of Deuteronomy. God was grieved. We read both in Genesis and in the Psalms. Grief is a word of emotion. The Bible also talks about grieving God, the Holy Spirit. Grief is the emotion. We know that God is a loving God, is he not? But on the other hand, we find the word hate also used in connection with the God of the universe. Have you ever come across the word jealousy when reading your Bible in connection with the God of the Bible? Uh, of course, God's jealousy, we, we could say, is a righteous jealousy. We might call it righteous and protective indignation against those who belong to him, or, or, or to guard those who belong to him. But nonetheless, jealousy is an emotion, as is pleasure. The Bible talks about God taking pleasure in them that fear him and about God having no pleasure in some other things. Pleasure is a word of emotion, folks. So God is depicting himself in terms of emotion. We read about God's rejoicing and about the joy of the Lord in his word. So put it all together. Anger, laughter, compassion, grief, love, hate, jealousy, pleasure, and joy are all words of emotion. And God's attitude at various times and through various economies is described to us in those very terms. Is that not interesting? How about the God-man, Jesus Christ? If God the Father can depict himself as, as having emotions, what about the God-man, Jesus Christ? Christ, was he a man of emotions? The Bible's full of emotional terms, by the way, in connection with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll just mention those that can be found in Scripture. What is the quickest verse to learn 
or people that are going under what we used to call the sword drills. What was the first, the first statement, the first verse you wanted to memorize and you knew you'd have that one? Somebody help me. Jesus wept. Why, certainly. The Bible tells us. Great memory, right? <laughs> Jesus felt compassion. The Bible tells us he was angry. The Bible states that he was indignant. We find that in God's word. Christ was consumed with zeal, we read. He was troubled. He was greatly distressed. He was deeply moved. He was grieved. He sighed. He sobbed. He groaned. He was in agony. He was surprised. He was amazed. He rejoiced very greatly, and he was full of joy. He greatly desired, and he greatly loved. Every one of these descriptions of the God-man Jesus Christ can be placed within a category, and the label on the top could say emotion. Jesus Christ, the second member of the Godhead, was a man of many emotions. Why would the creator of the universe and the designer of emotions depict himself as well as the Son of God in terms of emotion if emotions were bad things? Fact is, he wouldn't. Emotions are not bad things. Emotions are good things. However, allowing our emotions to control us is not a good thing. Allowing emotions to make our decisions for us is not a good thing. That can be a very bad thing. In fact, that can be a very harmful thing. Emotions, as I've said many times, make a wonderful slave. They make a horrible master. Do you suppose the one that the Bible describes as being the God of this world, little g, the prince of the power of the air, do you suppose he understands the working of man's emotions? Do you suppose the world system is a system designed to give emotions a leading role when wisdom should have the lead role, especially where believers are concerned. How do emotions play a role when it comes to the world system and feeding the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life? Is there a connection between emotions and sins? In in union, I should say, with the world system that's in place. There's been an interesting medical observation made by some leading endocrinologists, and I'll share those with you. We'll tie these things into not being conformed to this world in just a moment. I haven't gotten off track here, by the way. This study is by Dr. Lustig. Anyone heard of Dr. Lustig? Dr. Lustig, um, and this has to do with the chemistry of the body, by the way, and the difference in pleasure and joy-based happiness, as Dr. Lustig explains. Both are terms of emotion, by the way, joy and happiness. And, uh, but let's look at some differences here. You see, there's a chemical component to your emotions that's very important to understand when looking at the world system and how that world system is designed to feed man's quest to fulfill the lust of his flesh, the lust of his eyes, the pride of life. The question is, what is the difference in pleasure and joy-based happiness? I can tell you there's a chemical difference here that we need to look at. And why is it important to understand that difference between pleasure and joy-based happiness? The author of the book of Hebrews talks about the pleasures of sin for a season. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25, let's quickly read that statement. Choosing, rather, to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the, next word, pleasures of sin for a season. Notice the author of the book of the Hebrew to the Hebrews there didn't say to enjoy or to to, uh, <laughs> to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the joy and happiness of sin. He said the pleasures of sin. Is there a difference? Well, Dr. Lustig says there is. So again, what's the difference in pleasures and joy-based happiness? And how does a confusion of those two most important and, and wonderful positive emotions play into a world system designed to feed man's quest to satisfy the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. I have to tell you, this is far beyond my pay grade. <laughs> so I'm only quoting what I can remember here, and I can't remember a lot of it, but I'll show you what I've learned thus far in my studies, of the biochemistry of man in connection with pleasure on one side, happiness, joy-based happiness on the other. Some of you have heard of, of Dr. Robert Lustig, possibly. Dr. Lustig... Lustwig, by the way, specializes in neuroendocrinology uh, at the University of California, San Diego. And he points out seven differences in pleasure 
in what we might call joy-based happiness. A lot of people think they're one and the same. In fact, he points out that if you go to the Internet, they, they mix the two up as though they're the same thing. Dr. Lustig says they are not one and the same thing. And he can use endocrinology to prove that to us. Watch him point out the differences in pleasure and happiness, and we would say joy-based happiness. Again, both are positive emotions. Nothing wrong with either one, but there are some differences in the two in the chemistry of the body and the mind related to those two things. And he points out seven differences in pleasure on one side, happiness on the other. So let's take a quick look at what he has to say. I'll quickly give you his list. Pleasure is short-lived. Some would say short-lived. I don't care how you want to pronounce it. Pleasure lasts very, a very short time, and it's over. Happiness, joy-based happiness on, happiness, on the other hand, is long-lived. Pleasure is visceral body-related. Happiness is ethereal, mind-related. Pleasure is taking. Happiness is giving. Pleasure can be achieved with substances. Happiness cannot be achieved. Joy-based happiness cannot be achieved with substances. Pleasure can be achieved alone. Happiness is achieved in connection with others. The, extreme of, the extremes of pleasure all lead to addiction whether they be substances or behaviors. There's no such thing as being addicted to too much joy-based happiness. And according to this study of neuroendocrinology, Dr. Lustig tells us that pleasure is dopamine, whereas happiness is serotonin. Now we're getting more into the medical basis for what he's talking about. As Dr. Lustig explains, serotonin and dopamine are two biochemicals. Both are neurotransmitters. In other words, they are two chemicals that the brain, the brain makes, among numerous others, and uses to communicate between one brain cell and one neuron and another. I know this sounds complicated, but stay with me for a moment. I want to show you how the world system makes use of the biochemistry of our minds and how the world system uses that biochemistry to its financial advantage. We're just going to look at two, those two biochemicals, many others, but we're just looking at those two. The biochemical called serotonin and the biochemical called dopamine. There are numerous others, as I said, but for the purposes of study, we'll concentrate on these, these two. I'm sure you've heard those two terms. The dopamine, is it dopamine or dopamine? Anyone know? <laughs> dopamine, okay. Dopamine is an exciter. Now, what's that mean? While the other, serotonin, is an inhibitor, Dr. Lustig explains. Let me try to explain it as he does. The biochemical dopamine excites its receptor, whereas the biochemical serotonin inhibits its receptor. What does that mean in layman's terms? It means that over time, according to Dr. Lustig, it takes larger hits of dopamine to achieve the same rush or the same sense of excitement that we often think of as pleasure. <laughs> over time, and with too much dopamine-related stimulation or neuron excitement, neurons actually start to die. Does the brain protect you and protect itself in that sense? Yes. The excitement, when it becomes too much, those neurons begin to die. And as a form of protection, the brain's defense mechanism works to reduce the number of receptors, receptors that are available to be stimulated so that too many neurons don't have to die through that continual rush of dopamine. You can see how when pleasure is sought after for pleasure's sake alone, dopamine is always being called for. And it always takes larger hits of dopamine to accomplish that same feeling of satisfaction known as pleasure, according to Dr. Lustig, when those neurons excited by dopamine begin to die. Hit after hit after hit leads to tolerance, Dr. Lustig says. And the next step beyond tolerance, according to the doctor, is addiction as we're addicted to the hit of dopamine. And it all ties into man's quest for pleasure. As pleasure, not necessarily a bad thing at all, but as pleasure is being sought after only for pleasure's sake, which indeed can be a bad thing. Serotonin, on the other hand, inhibits its receptor to produce not that excited pleasure feeling, but to produce a contentment feeling. Serotonin doesn't excite. It inhibits, according to Dr. Lustig. You cannot overdose a neuron for serotonin, he tells us. It's impossible. 
rather than causing neurons to fire up, exciting them, which can lead to neuron death, serotonin actually works to inhibit or slow down the process of those neurons, which results in a contented state of mind, according to Dr. Lustig, or what we might call joy-related happiness. Now stay with me again. There is one thing, according to Dr. Lustig, that down-regulates serotonin. What might that be? Anyone have a guess? What down-regulates serotonin? If you've guessed dopamine, you're right. He says dopamine down, downgrade serotonin. So the more pleasure that is sought after for pleasure's sake only, for the thrill of the moment, for that pleasure moment, the more we seek, the more we seek creating that pleasurable experience, the more unhappy we eventually get. Does that make sense? This is Dr. Lustig's view, meaning the less contentment you achieve and you're looking for the next pleasurable high. Here we need to ask the question, what is the world system selling and peddling off as happiness? Pleasure. Pleasure. It's peddling pleasure and hoping you'll confuse the two. In other words, it is selling pleasure under the heading of happiness. When you see the people on the beach and they're all having the great time of their life and everyone's got the bottle or the can, doesn't it look like they're happy? Ask an alcoholic, does drinking, does addiction bring you happiness? Or does it bring you momentary pleasure? Does the drinking bring you long-lasting, joy-based happiness? Or does it bring, bring you pleasure while you're either feeling the high or creating the numb? Which is it? The world system isn't selling joy-based happiness. The world system is selling pleasure and hoping you confuse it with happiness. Pleasure in this context is all about the quest to satisfy the lusts of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He makes a very interesting case, and it's far more intricate than I could explain to you here in a few minutes. Listen to what he says here. This is a quote from Dr. Lustwig. Las Vegas, Madison Avenue, Wall Street, Silicon Valley, and Washington, D.C. have very specifically and in a coordinated fashion confused and conflated or mixed together the term happiness with the term pleasure. What is he saying? Well, he's saying, if I'm hearing him correctly, what he's saying is that in man's quest for what man perceives as fulfillment or contentment-based happiness, joy-based happiness, we could call it, man has bought into the false notion, with the help of the world system, that happiness can be, joy-based happiness can be purchased. And the world system is a system designed to sell it to you in a myriad of forms. Do you see the danger in confusing pleasure with happiness, as Dr. Lustig explains it to, you can certainly buy fleshly-based pleasure, which is short-lived at best, as the pleasures of sin for a moment, for a season, the author of Hebrews put it, but joy-based happiness is not something that can be purchased. You cannot purchase it in a pill. You cannot purchase joy-based happiness in a bottle. Uh, the lust of the flesh pleasure, no matter the source uh, or the entertainment value therein. Man's quest for pleasure, confused as happiness once again, has resulted in addiction after addiction after addiction, according to Dr. Lustig. All an attempt to satisfy the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And purchasing it, will ne you'll never find long-lasting fulfillment in that. It's short life. What the world system is peddling is momentary pleasure as though momentary pleasure and happiness are one and the same thing. I believe what we could add to Dr. Lustig's list that began with Las Vegas and ended with Washington, D.C. as peddlers of pleasure for the purpose of profit, we could add some things. Here's a quote taken from a Bible commentary. The world has its own politics, art, music, religion, amusements, thought patterns, lifestyles, and it seeks to get everyone conformed to its culture and its customs. That could be stated in a different way. The world has its own pleasure-seeking system when it comes to feeding the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And religion is right there among the mix. You see how the world system is designed to attack man in the realm of, of his emotions? Emotions and thinking being intricately intertwined and good things 
Satan's battle with God today, believe it or not, where mankind is concerned, is a battle for the mind. And we shouldn't think that emotions are not a useful target for the adversary. This is why Paul's epistles are filled with what I like to call doctrine of thinking. In Philippians chapter 2, for instance, verses 5 through 7, Paul said, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of what? No reputation. Took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. Let this thinking become your thinking. Here's a renovation of the mind, is it not? Let Christ's thinking become your thinking. Are you on the throne of your life? Is serving the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is that uppermost in your mind? Is serving self take precedent over putting self off, taking self off the throne and doing that which edifies and builds up others instead? Uh, the doctrine of thinking was on Paul's mind when he wrote the epistle immediately preceding this letter to the saints in Rome. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, not fleshly related at all, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What are those strongholds, Paul? Casting down imaginations. Casting down imaginations in every high thing. Imaginations are thoughts, are they not? Every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing in captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The doctrine of thinking was on Paul's mind after he wrote the Romans epistle when he also wrote about his prayer that believers be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. That's doctrine of thinking. A doctrine of thinking was the direction Paul was taking when he wrote the opening words of Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Here they are once again. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable worship service. <laughs> and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Are we seeking pleasure? Does it trump seeking joy-based happiness by the decisions we make in our lives? At no time did Jesus Christ entertain a notion of pursuing the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. Jesus Christ never bought into a notion that joy could be purchased. That would have been completely foreign to his thinking. Satan used that tactic to tempt or to test Christ, and the emotional tactic, and you know how well that worked for Satan. <laughs> didn't, didn't gain him a grain of uh, success. Jesus Christ came to give. He didn't come to get. Jesus Christ came to serve. He didn't come to be served. Jesus Christ humbled himself. He never exalted himself. He was willing to lay aside the throne and take up the cross for the sake of those he loved who hated him. Christ came not seeking his own glory, but sacrifice him, sacrificing himself in order that that others might be glorified through his sacrifice. Would it not be only reasonable that we set serving self aside for that which edifies and unifies others? Paul defines that as worship. Paul tells us it's reasonable worship. This is why the Apostle Paul is calling upon those who believe the gospel of Christ to offer our bodies a living sacrifice unto God and why he's exhorting us to be not conformed to this world and its fleshly-based system of selling pleasure as though pleasure and joy-based happiness are one and the same thing. The world system is designed for the feeding of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. They are not one and the same thing. Happiness can never be obtained by feeding the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. If you're on a quest for true joy-based happiness and you accept pleasure of the moment for a substitute, you'll gain only disappointment and disillusionment when you want that pleasure to last a while, when you want that joy to become a part of your being. I believe it's important we understand the difference in pleasure and happiness in the context Dr. Lustig, Lustig is placing it here, so that in a quest for joy-based happiness, we don't accept momentary pleasure as a suitable substitute that can be purchased. The world system is promoting that substitution. Momentary pleasure can entrap you such that it eventually enslaves you and it's faster than you might imagine. 
Dr. Robert Lustig is simply showing how the biochemistry of the mind fits into the picture here. Paul's calling upon all believers to set aside self, to offer their bodies a living sacrifice in order to serve others because that is the only place where true joy-based happiness can be found. I like to call Romans chapter 12 the love chapter of Romans because that's exactly what it is. Just as 1 Corinthians chapter 13 has been called the love chapter of the Corinthian epistles, chapter 12 can rightly be called the love chapter of Romans. You see, wholly unacceptable or well-pleasing worship unto God today has to do with not being conformed to the world system and its notion that happiness can be purchased, but rather through the being transformed by the renewing of our minds, which will in turn allow us to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God and that's putting others, elevating others, unifying others, edifying others, uh, and laying self aside. In direct connection with the mind transforming, rather than world conforming, that Paul just mentioned in our passage, he takes us straight from acceptable worship to agape love. That's where he's headed. He's taking, straight to, taking us straight to agape love. He not only takes us there, he gives us God's criteria for a well-pleasing evaluation of our labor of love at the judgment seat of Christ. What Paul's showing us is that a well-pleasing labor, labor of love and well-pleasing worship are one and the same thing. Let's move ahead to verse 3 in Romans chapter 12. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, satisfying the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, himself on the throne, but to think soberly according, has God, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. I believe I explained in an earlier message that the measure of faith Paul's speaking of here in Romans has nothing to do with God gifting some people with more faith than he gifts other people with. That would be the quantitative faith approach. Those who take this passage quantitatively would look at this verse and say, God has given every man a specific quantity or amount of faith. Can you hear God in connection with a quantitative faith approach when it comes to what might be called saving faith or serving faith, better yet? You there. <laughs> I've given you 47 and a half pounds per square inch of faith. You're going to have to be the pastor. And I've given others of you 35 pounds per square inch of faith. You folks go out and be the Sunday school teachers. You can take charge of the young children. Those of you who found yourself with 15 pounds per square inch of faith, well, you folks... Sing in the choir, vacuum the floors, take the, out the trash, prepare the coffee, straighten the chairs. The rest of you that I've gifted with just a smattering of faith here and there, well, you people are just going to have to go out and do the best you can with what little bit I've given you. Does the quantitative approach sound reasonable to you? After all, I've given you the amount I've given you, not a pound per square inch more, so do make the best of what you have. You're just expected to show up from time to time. Does that sound right? The quantitative approach, approach is wrong. That's not what Paul's saying here, that he's given everybody a certain amount of faith. Do you see the absurdity of the quantitative faith approach? That isn't the context of the passage. That isn't what Paul's talking about here. The context is service that qualifies as acceptable, and God's given us the measure of that service. He's given us the standard connected to that service. This has nothing to do with a person's quantity of faith or whether or not God has pushed a button causing some people to believe, gifting them with a proper quantity of what might be called saving faith, as some notions are out there, while refusing to push that button for others, what then is the measure of faith that God has dealt to every man? The measure of faith that Paul's talking about here in Romans, and how does this measure of faith fit in with a believer's reasonable worship and the practice of agape love? Quantity's not the idea, once again. Quality is the idea here. Acceptable worship is the idea. You see, God didn't exclude anyone when it comes to reasonable worship. And worship is what this passage is all about. Every member of the body of Christ has a function or functions to perform. Functions in which they can present their bodies a living sacrifice in the edifying and unifying of other members of the body. No one is excluded. No one placed above others. And each and every function is, is, is vital to the spiritual health and vitality, the well-being of the body of Christ as every other function. In designing the body of Christ as a vital living organism, God has provided that each and every member have an area in which they can offer themselves up in service to the other members of the body. 
Paul's going to take us straight to agape love in our Romans passage here. Does that not fit in well with what he wrote to the believers in Ephesus? As seen in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16. Listen to this and see if it fits in. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which, how many? Every joint supplieth according to the effectual working and the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So again, Paul's statement about the measure of faith has nothing to do with quantity or supernatural, supernatural endowment of more faith than others where worshiping God or serving the body of Christ is concerned. That is the idea. That isn't Paul's, where he's taking us here. It has more to do with quality in connection with faithful worship. In other words, what qualifies as faithful worship from God's perspective? What is the standard for that faithful worship that God considers acceptable? That's the idea here. Uh, listen to how one dictionary defines the word measure. The rule or standard of judgment. You see, God has a standard when it comes to worship that would be acceptable or well-pleasing to him. Worship that will be reward-worthy at the judgment seat of Christ. Paul is calling it the standard or the measure of Relative to faith. Notice that passage once again. Romans chapter 12 verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. But to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man. Faith's standard. The measure of faith. Paul's talking about the standard of service that God has set. In order to qualify as being acceptable worship in connection with those of faith. We might say it this way, God has dealt to every man a standard when it comes to his worship. We know this is the proper interpretation because Paul's going to continue by defining that standard for us. He's actually going to spell it out. At issue here then is this, does our worship, which Paul defines as our reasonable service where other members of the body of Christ are concerned, does it measure up to God's standard? Or have we been allowing emotions to dictate our actions, thus creating our own standard? I believe we've already shown how emotions can muddy the water. Emotions were muddying the water in the assemblies of Paul's day. They were certainly muddying the water in, in the assemblies at Corinth. The same was true in Philippi. Emotions had even muddied the water in Galatia. And obviously they were muddying the water in the assembly at Rome. Thus this presentation or obligation cornerstone of Paul's Romans epistle that we're studying right now. How had emotions affected the assemblies of Paul's day? We can be certain they were affecting the assemblies and they are affecting the assemblies in our day in the very same way. Watch Paul take them to their interconnectedness in verses four and five. For we have as for as we have many members in one body, all members have not the same office. So we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. The word office there in verse four is the Greek praxis, which literally means practice or function. It's not an office to which a believer is appointed. Rather, it's a function. It's a role to play in connection with serving the body of Christ. It's each individual's practice concerning that role. It's just as Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, the whole body is, body is fitly joined together and compacted, meaning fitly knit together, united together as one living organism. The definition of the Greek word translated compacted is united as one, united to form the whole. Every member of the body of Christ is intricately joined to every other member of the body of Christ. How closely knit together are we? Are we? It's interesting that Paul used the human body with its various components or members to paint the picture of our oneness as God perceives the body of Christ. We'll be looking at that very soon. Did you ever consider that you are as intricately and spiritually joined to every other member of the body of Christ as you are to Christ himself? A real union from God's perspective? Let that sink in for a moment. We revel, do we not, in our union with our Savior. We love being joined to Him. But to what degree do we appreciate and celebrate those saints to whom we are likewise joined here on earth? How about those saints we like the least? <laughs> Did you also know that God considers our appreciation of those members of the body to whom we are joined as proven by our attitudes and treatment of those believers, to be connected to our reasonable worship to him? That's what Paul's been telling us here in Romans chapter 12, folks. Serving the body of Christ is worshiping God according to Paul. Every member of the body of Christ is of utmost importance in the organism that God designed called the body of Christ. I know that many of you have heard that Irish ditty or a variation uh, thereof go something like this, to live above with the saints I love. Oh, will that be glory. <laughs> 
But to live below with the saints I know, ooh, that's another story. <laughs> the effective functioning of every member of the body of Christ is absolutely necessary, essential to the health and well-being of the body of Christ as a whole. Therefore, it's important that we operate in accordance with God's standard, and Paul's going to take us there next. That's where he's taking us next. So in our next lesson, we'll be looking at that standard, and we'll be considering the body, the physical body, in terms of each of the members. We'll go there on our next lesson.